of all, I just, wow, I just want to say I love you, Pastor. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And how many know it's holy to submit to a pastor? Yeah. It's a holy thing when you have a pastor that believes in you and supports you. And I, I count that holy. And to submit to that and to be able to come up under that and learn from that is very, very, very important. So I honor that. And I don't, and this is a holy thing here. I don't take it lightly. So thank you, Pastor Noah. And Pastor Pearl, too, back there. Yeah. I love my pastor. Do y'all love your pastors? Yes. yes. I've been here four years and uh, just fall more in love with them. They're just amazing. And I know it's Jesus, but put honor where honor is due. So I so appreciate this. Um, the Lord has given me, well, y'all know me. My message doesn't change. <laughs> it's Jesus and the bridal call and the bridal fire of God. That's who I am. I'm not going to preach anything else. It's always going to be Jesus, the bridegroom, who's longing for his bride. That's, that's my life message. We are a living epistle known and read of all men. Okay. Can y'all hear me okay? <laughs> this is who we are. So the message isn't going to change. So someone's like, oh, what are you going to preach? Well, I'm the bride. Yeah. Okay? Because it's still the same message. The message has not changed. It's about Jesus, the bridegroom. It will never change. Jesus is the only answer for every element that any of us face. He's the only answer. We can't come up with anything yeah. else apart from him. If we do, it's witchcraft. It's spiritual adultery. He is the only one. So I'm going to preach about the bridegroom. Man. Like I always do <laughs> for the past 25 years. And so um, you can be seated if you want. And uh, at least I totally leave that up to you, whatever you uh, feel comfortable with. But obey the Lord on that. And uh, thank you, Lord. <coughs> thank you, Lord. So don't miss the message. The message of Jesus, the good news. Don't miss the message because sometimes we can be looking for all these things and pass him right up. And that's why I love this song that she's singing about looking at him in his eyes. And what Pastor Norm shared on Sunday, that scripture in 2 Chronicles 7.14. I love that. It's a prayer to seek his face. You know, and, and, and turn from your wicked ways. But a lot of us truthfully miss the part that says seek his face. Yes. Okay, that's beyond prayer. The prayer is amazing. We're supposed to be in prayer, but prayer without presence doesn't really, it's not that effective. Why? Because prayer is supposed to be an exchange between you and God. It's not just you coming before him and being repetitious about all these things, and, and, and it's good. He hears you. Understand what I'm saying. But he is meaning to make an exchange with you. And so when you come into a place where you're seeking his face, you're looking straight at him in his eyes. You're looking at who he is. You're coming face to face with him. And that's an exchange. I don't know about you, but when I'm talking to somebody, I like to, them to look at me in my face. I like to see their eyes. I like to see if they're hearing me. I like to see if we're connecting. Especially, you know, my husband and, you know, uh, different relationships. And, and I want them to see me and I want to make sure they're looking at me because I know that I am making sense to them and they're hearing what I'm saying and they're understanding me. It's the same thing with God when we're seeking his face. We're looking at him right in his eyes. And there's a connection. There's an exchange. And that's the kind of prayer, hallelujah, that impacts. You become one with him. It's a oneness and it's in the scriptures. And I want to talk about oneness versus religion. And what is religion? What is a man-made religion? And what keeps us away from God? And a lot of you know my testimony. But um, I wrote a book about 17, 18 years ago. And it's called Abandoned at the Altar. And some, a couple of you, my leaders, and you guys read the book. It, it, the Lord won't let me publish it because it's not time. It's about him. It's not about me. But it's about my life story with God. But on the front cover, it has the Father over the union. Jesus is at the altar, and there's a threefold altar. You get married at the altar, you die you know, at the altar, you give your heart to Jesus at the altar. And so the Father is awaiting to bless the union between Jesus and his bride. And he's at the altar, and she, the bride, has been lured away by an illusion. 
by a deception. And that's what's happening in the church today is they're being lured away by an illusion and a deception, a fable that's not even reality. They're being taken away from Christ. And the message of Christ has been so diluted and even cast to the side. Nobody wants to talk about Jesus anymore being the bridegroom. Nobody wants to talk about him. So she's been lured away, the church, by some other sort of uh, theology that's not Christ, that's not the gospel. And so I just really want to talk about this deception that has lured her away and how we can come back into a place of understanding to be able to look at, look at him in his eyes, to be able to fall in love with Jesus, the bridegroom. Um, the Bible says in Isaiah 54, 5, For your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of the whole earth. He bans you. That's what a husband is. He bans you. He takes care of you. He becomes one with you. This is the whole identity of abiding in Christ. This is the whole identity of being one in Christ. You know, it amazes me that... Uh, on the back of my car, I have a license plate that says in Christ, and the letter N, and then Christ. It amazes me how many Christians ask me what that means. I'm like, what? <laughs> Ephesians, Galatians, Colossians, what? This union that we have with Jesus. We're supposed to be in Christ. This is what it's all for. This is why he came. And there's no understanding, and I'm like, Really? Well, sit down. Let me show you. Let me show you the word. Oh, wow. See, because when you become, when you come into a place where you're in Christ, your flesh no longer matters. If we could just get the concept that our old man is dead. And I know I, I preached on this before about the old man being dead and how we try to put the old man back on again and we try to get God to fix the old man. God's not going to fix the old man. He wants to do away with it. <laughs> That's what the word says. Yeah. He wants to do away with it. He's not into behavior modification, okay? He's into a new creature, yeah. new man. <laughs> and that's who we put on. And we're in Christ in, the, in that sense. I'm going to read you scripture on that. But I want to talk about religion. Um, I want to, first, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This, is, this will blow your mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, um, verse 1 through 4. And like I said, a lot of this stuff I've been over with you over and over and over again, but God's good. I've been so focused on the young adults and stuff, I haven't really been able to teach in the sanctuary for a while. Gosh, it's been how long since I've, I've been doing lilies in the young adults? Six months? Or more? But hopefully that uh, you still remember the message. God is good. Thank you. Um, Second Corinthians chapter 11. Um, verse 1 through 4. I'm reading out of the Passion Translation, so y'all be proud of me because my other Bible that I've got for so long is falling apart, so I'm going to read out of this one that was given to me. Um, let's start with verse 2. This is Paul speaking. You need to know that God's passion is burning inside of me for you because like a loving father, I have pledged your hand in marriage to Christ, your true bridegroom. I've also promised that I would present his fiance to him as a pure virgin bride. But now I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's clever, clever lies, your thoughts may be corrupted and you may lose your single-hearted devotion and pure love for Christ. For you seem too gladly to tolerate anyone who comes to you preaching a pseudo-Jesus, not the Jesus that we have preached. For you have accepted a spirit and a gospel that is false, rather than the spirit and gospel that you once embraced. And you tolerate it, and you have tolerated these impostors. So what is Paul saying here? He's espoused you to Christ, your true bridegroom. But you've allowed this other gospel to come in. And to keep you from your single-hearted devotion and pure love for Christ. In other words, you're going through the motions. How many know if we just fall in love, all is well? You got me? If you just fall in love, stay, keep his gaze. Don't lose his gaze. If you're in that place and you come to that place where your eyes are only on Jesus, he's the answer for everything. I really feel like things will get a lot better for you. Because any time we get off and allow that deception to take us away from Christ, what happens is we lose our joy. 
we lose our passion, we lose everything that gives us the ability to move forward called grace. Because grace, yes, is unmerited favor, but grace is also an ability of power, hallelujah, that gives you the power to endure this called life, yes. this walk of life. Grace is that empowerment. It's like God smears us with his ability called grace. It's called the anointing too. But there's so much more to grace, but that I'm not going to go there because the Lord's directed me somewhere else. I was going to talk about grace um, in the sense of religion, but he really wants to uh, drill this into you because it is so easy for us to get caught up into the spirit of religion. Yeah. Especially if we've been in a place where we've been saved for years and years and years. And we don't even realize what's happened to us. It's become a job. Um, the best, the best uh, scripture that I can think of, um, I'll just run it through. Matthew 9, 10 talks about where Jesus sat with the tax collectors. And I love teaching this to my young adults because they love the story. A couple of y'all are here tonight. Desmond and ones. But Jesus is sitting and he's eating with the tax collectors. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees see this, you know, and uh, the disciples and, and the Pharisees, and they were talking, and Jesus was sitting there eating with the tax collectors. And the Pharisees were like, why is your master sitting down with these tax collectors? And Jesus overheard them. And he said, don't you know? I came for those who need a hospital. Okay, he didn't come for the righteous. He came for the sinner. And he told the Sadducees and the Pharisees, go and learn what this means. Because obviously you don't know. Go learn what it means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Yeah. Matthew 9, 10. So all of our sacrifices that we do every day means nothing if you don't have mercy. Means nothing if you're not seeing Jesus in his eyes. If you're not holding his gaze. Because it's all about him anyway. The message is never going to change. You know, people used to tell me when I first got saved, when the Lord came to me, um, most of you know my, my testimony. It's been about 20, I keep saying 25 years, but now I realize it's been about 27 years ago. <laughs> when I was in a woman's home, and I was, I was just desperate. And my cry to God was, nobody's ever going to want me. I have these three girls, nobody's ever going to want to marry me. Lord, why did this happen? And he walked with me through the whole thing, because I knew him at a young age when I was seven. And he spoke to me, and he said, marry me. And I did Marry him. I came into a place with him where he was my everything. He healed my heart. He made me whole. He taught me how to love myself. He taught me how to love a husband. He taught me how to love people because of my story. Come on, you know what I've been through. You know, the cloth offering, like Pastor says. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm your Timothy. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's amazing. He made me whole. Yeah. So all I'm going to talk about is Jesus. He is my husband. And I love him with everything. The Bible says that there's so many scriptures in here that talks about him being the bridegroom and we're preparing for this wedding. And so I don't understand some people that don't understand that we are the bride of Christ. I don't get it because he takes us into a union with him. You know, if I was saying something that was bad, I could see why people would get angry. <laughs> What's wrong with being married to Jesus? <laughs> I mean... It's like you're depending on him for everything. He said to love him with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind. Everything that you got, love him. Yeah, Sounds yeah. like a husband to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so what's this man-made religion is a stench to God. It stinks to him. I'm going to talk about what is it. Because sometimes we don't understand what religion is. But Jesus said the most purest religion is to care and visit. Care and visit the widow and the fatherless. Not just care for, care and visit. That's the most purest religion. So what I'm talking about here is a form of the law that institutes that you've got to do, 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 do in order to be accepted by him. When he's already done all the work. Yeah. It's not do, it's be. Yeah, right. Period. And not that we're not supposed to do. Understand what I'm saying? But are you doing it with the right heart? Are you doing it with the right motive? <laughs> are you doing it out of your love and your adoration for Jesus? Huh. Are you doing this because... I love you, Lord. I love you. Whatever you want. Whatever you want. Not, I got to do this because there's nobody else. Here's what cold, dark religion consists of. 
First thing is what the Lord showed me is appetite. Your appetite is the key. What is your appetite? And I want you to research that tonight in your soul. I want you to ask them, what is this thing, that, this appetite that I have? Because religion has an appetite and oneness has an appetite. The bridal fire of God has an appetite. And her appetite, all she desires is Jesus. There's nothing else. All she desires is to be with him. And if you stay in that place, it keeps you. It keeps you. But religion has an appetite. And everything that religion desires... It feeds off a of forced and artificial performance coupled with carnal notions of heaven. It feeds off of it. It feeds off a of performance. It's having a form of godliness with no power. Where does the power come from? Power comes from your connection to Christ. If you're abiding in him and his words abide in you, the vine, you're in the vine, and then fruit pops out. You really don't have to work. Honestly, it's about connection. Same thing with prayer. It's about an exchange. Relationship. One of the examples of religion, uh, this is from, um, I love this book called uh, The Soul of Man. And it's a really powerful book. And there was an example of religion in there. And I think I shared this the last time I spoke too, but it's so good. <laughs> religion is cold and spiritless. Like an uneasy compliance of a wife married against her will, who carries it dutifully towards the husband that she doesn't even love, out of some sort of false uh, virtue and honor. That is so much like religion. You're here because you got to be here. You really don't want to be here. You really have no love exchange. You're just here because it's the right thing to do. I'll tell you, Satan does not want you to know who you are, but you are the bride of Christ. He does not want you to know that he longs for you. Y'all know my, my whole thing is the book of Hosea. So uh, I'm going, a lot of you guys know me here. So he longs for you. He's running after you. He's pursuing you. And he doesn't care if you've been with other lovers and had other children by other lovers. He doesn't care if you're in spiritual adultery. He'll still go and get you and pick you up, clean you off, and buy you back again, just like Hosea did with Gomer. His love for you is so overwhelming that he pursues you every single second of every day. Why do you think the Bible says in Psalm that God's thoughts towards you are innumerable every day, more than the sand of the sea? There's no question about if you're loved. <laughs> There's no question if you're desired. There's no question if you're wanted. This is the love letter. It's all over here. How much he desires you and wants you. and It's about you yielding to what he's already done. So, I'll say it again. I hate religion. The Lord has anointed me to destroy it. How will I destroy it with the love relationship with Jesus, my bridegroom? Isn't that amazing how when it says he's the bridegroom, bride and groom are in the same, <laughs> same word. In the Hebrew, it talks about them being one. Y'all yes. act shocked. If you read your Bible, you read it everywhere in there. Read the New Testament. So, wow, that must be miserable, being a woman who is married to someone who doesn't even love the person and is forced to be with them just because they feel like it's out of their right thing to do. I mean, that sounds miserable. You should be here because you want to be here, because you are so recklessly in love with him, you do whatever he wants, because you love him so much, because he saved you, because he made you whole, because he spared you. Because you don't know how many times he saved your life out there. So religion always robs us of true communion with Christ, true oneness. It'll always come against it. And then you think to yourself, why would someone come against oneness with Christ? Why would someone in the church come against that? I don't get it. <laughs> when he's your everything. I don't, I don't understand that. It boggles me. 
It's religion. There's also a scripture in Matthew 23. I want to read. I don't want to read too much right now because I'm going to go over them on here. But there's so much more scripture in depth that I have that I feel like the Lord wants me to read. But just like that uh, scripture in Matthew 9:10 with the Pharisees and Sadducees. How many know the Pharisees and Sadducees shut up the kingdom of heaven? They shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, and they don't even go in themselves. And Jesus even told them that. He said, "Look what you do. You you, you don't even go in yourself, and you don't even let them go in." And then you raise up disciples that are more evil than you. This is that spirit. It robs you from going in. The kingdom of heaven is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's not meat and drink. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And how many know anytime we get in the presence of Jesus, we have joy? Yes. You know, people sometimes that ask me when I'm up here, <laughs> you know, why? Well, not with the lilies, but other places like we're actually going to be going to Georgia, and I'm going to be speaking at Reach again this year, like last year. And we're also having a lily gathering. And um, thank you, Lisa. This is Lisa. She's going to be playing the keyboard for when I speak at Reach now. And the Lord has called her to come alongside me when I go minister places. And I love that because it's, she's an answer <laughs> to prayer, and she's amazing. And we've known her for a while now. And then Barbara and Linda's here. And we're all going to Georgia on Monday. Um, so we're excited about that. But... That spirit of religion will come against you getting closer to what God has already done for you on the cross. It'll come against healing. It'll come against uh, oneness. It'll come against the bridal call on your life for Jesus. It'll Because see, the bride is not male nor female. You can't look at it in a natural sense. We're talking about a spirit oneness here. We're not talking, you think, look at your carnal mind, you can't understand God. Even Jesus said it was, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. But he's calling you to come in. So religion will shut up the kingdom, just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They shut it up against men, and they wouldn't even go in themselves, but they didn't want anybody else to experience it. You ever been around those kind of people? You want something, and you're like, I'm, you're hungry for God, and you're fasting, and you're doing this, and, and you know, you're, you're all excited and all this stuff, and you know, they, they're like, you know, well, just, just do this. You know, this is okay. You don't have to do all that. You don't have to go deeper. Just stay where you're at. Don't say much. And we'll be happy with you. <laughs> How many have experienced those kind of people? Okay. All right. I'm not the only one. <laughs> I mean, there, there was such a, I had, still have such a passion about Jesus and being everything to me. And being my bridegroom. And my daughter's here and she knows. I got broke with nuts probably from the time they were teeny tiny. Because he came to me. And I fell in love with him. And he was my everything. And still is. And he always will be. And people would tell me, you know, Julie, you need to get a hobby. <laughs> I'm serious. Even my own parents who love the Lord. And I thought, get a hobby? Because I took a year and I went up to the wall pies. When, I, when the Lord first told me to come to Kingman, I thought I would get away with it. Uh, I said, okay, I'll take a year sabbatical off the lilies. Because I'm doing lilies in San Diego. So I took a year sabbatical before I actually moved here, up to the Wallapais. And I spent a year in clothes of the Lord. I didn't work or anything. I just spent a year with Jesus because I wanted to understand what he was showing me. And my parents were worried. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> and I love my parents. I mean, they're Pentecostals, okay? And they were worried. And I'm like, get a, get a hobby. I don't want a hobby. I'm in love with Jesus. He's everything. It was radical. You know, and I lived in the guest house up there, and some of the people up there, it was amazing. God did an amazing thing up there, but he transformed me in that place. This was 10 years ago. He transformed me in that place, and I've seen so many things about myself by taking that time with the Lord that year, okay? And, and, I, and I told my parents, I said, I don't want balance. <laughs> what, is, what do you mean? Get a, get a hobby, get balance. You know, and now they understand. Now they understand the call that's on my life because... It's like, then you're, you, they're worried about you when you do things like that. You fast for like six months. And <laughs> but thank God I did that. Thank God, because it made me ready for my move to Cayman. Because when I moved back to San Diego, the Lord said, no, I didn't tell you to take a year sabbatical. I told you to move there. Your sabbatical was good to get you ready. But you're moving there. And then I finally kick it and scream and came here 10 years ago. <laughs> so <laughs> thank God I did. I was so thankful. 
I love Canaan. I love Canaan. I never thought that I would say that. I love the people here. I love all you guys. I love my pastors. I'm so glad I came, even though I missed the beach. <laughs> but I can always go visit. But the Lord has grown. I've grown a heart for this land, and I've married this land. And I, I'm never going to move because we're doing our retirement place. I'm never going to move unless the Lord tells me to leave. I'm going to leave that home right there so I can always come back here. <laughs> so I've fallen in love with Canaan. But religion will kill, will kill and destroy everything that God has called for you and ordained for you to become if you allow it. Yeah. But how many know you have power over it? Oh, right? Yes. Yeah. What's the greatest, greatest thing you can do to come against religion? That's fear. What is it? See if anybody here knows. What kills religion? Intimacy, yes, first and foremost, but the truth. Truth. I'm here telling you the truth tonight. Jesus is so passionately in love with you. If you just, I dare you, I dare you to ask him, show me what it is to be married to you, Lord. Show me what it is to become one with you and the Holy Spirit and the Father. Show me what it is, what you paid for. To show me what it is to abide, to be inside of you. Show me what it is that when people looked at you, Jesus, they saw the Father. I want people, when they look at me, to see Jesus. Yeah. I don't want to be the old person that died in the ground. I want to be that new creation that has the DNA of heaven. That new creation is in time that the earth is groaning to come forth as the sons of God. That new creation that God paid for, that the Lord Jesus Christ himself bled for and died for. The Bible says that we were buried with him. We died with him, we're buried with him, and we're risen with him. That we're seated in him in heavenly places. That's more than one place, heavenly places. We're seated in Christ in heavenly places. What's wrong with us? Why are we still trying to hang on to that dead thing that stinks? Why are we still trying to hang on to our old ways? Why are we still begging God to, to come and fix our sin? He already did. It was, uh, I think it was John Piper who said, if you're struggling with sin, it's because you're not satisfied with God. Makes you think. Get satisfied with him. I guarantee you, if you come in and you ask him to reveal himself to you as your lover, everything else grows dim, just like the song said. When you get one look in his eyes, Nothing else matters. You won't have to struggle to become one with other people. <laughs> you won't have to struggle to love somebody. You'll be salivating love all over them, even when they hate you. <laughs> because you're so in love. When you're in love, you're focused. It's pure devotion. One of the biggest lies in the church is that Jesus wants wants you to do, wants you to continue to do just so you can earn his love. <clears throat> do more so he'll love you more. Do more so you'll be more perfect. You're never going to be any more righteous than you are right now at this moment when you receive Christ. You're never going to be any more righteous. It's a free gift. It's a free gift. If you can't get it by works, you can't lose it by works. That's a lie from the enemy. There's not anything that you have to do other than believe. And receive what's already been done. So oneness also has an appetite. Okay, and I really want you to look at what is your the appetite, the thing that you're craving. What do you crave? Is it your flesh craving or is it your spirit craving? Oneness has an appetite. It's to do, it's a meat and drink to do the Father's will, period. Nothing else. Oneness, that's the appetite of oneness. I want to be like Jesus and do what the Father's doing and say what the Father's saying. Nothing else. Nothing else matters. Does it? If it does, that might be the problem. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news. Whatever's good news about him 
You were the joy that was set before him at the cross. You. That's good news. He wants to become one with you. That's good news. Any other gospel is a lie. It's religion. Um, there's also a, a, a saying to, uh, you know, that the Lord gave me. And, and how, how many know sometimes the Lord will speak things to you that are personal, mm. that are just for you, that kind of heal your heart, and you feel like if you share them with anybody, you're like, whoa. I better not do that, okay? But I feel like I'm supposed to share this tonight. Um, the kind of abuse that I had gone through, these kind of things that the Holy Spirit would have the Lord speak to me, I needed to heal. Because when he came to me at a young age of seven years old, I knew him and I loved him, but I still went through some very bad things. But I knew he was there. I can't explain that. But he was with me. I understand it now. Because of all the women that I see transformed in front of me. Makes it all worth it. Because I'm called a women. Broken women. But he said to me, you are my only weakness. And I said, God, I, I thought you didn't have any weaknesses. You know, and he said, you're my weakness. And I just felt like so ugly and filthy and dirty and unworthy. But he began to show me in scripture how he took the one he loves, Jesus, and sent him to be beaten and stripped naked and bruised and his beard plucked out and beaten. Because you were God's weakness. He so loved you, so longed for you, that he gave his precious son. He gave his everything for you. Amen. How can we not give him our whole heart? How can we not marry him? How can we not love him? Sounds like God had a weakness. It's you. He wants his family. He's planning a family reunion. And Jesus was like, let me do it for you, Father. Let me go for you. Because the Father was Jesus' weakness. You see? So you're his only weakness. And we should be proud of the things that God speaks to us. Yes. Because there's deep truths in there that if we just take a minute and research the word of God, you'll find it in there. <laughs> Why would somebody give their pride and joy, their precious son, for someone else if that someone else wasn't of utmost importance to them? John 15, 4 and 5. John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. It says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's just one of the many. It's just one of the many. So, so in Christ, yeah, I live in him. And he lives in me. And in him I move and have my being. It reminds me of my dad when I say that scripture. <laughs> my dad's joke. <laughs> anyway, I better not say it. <laughs> Every time I read that scripture, I think of my daddy. I love him so much. Um. So our union with Christ is profoundly real and intensely intimate. I'm just going to go run through these uh, scriptures that are on being in a union with Christ. I want to read them in his passion, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to rush through them. So we are created in Christ, Ephesians 2.10. 
We are crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. We are buried with him, Colossians 2.12. We are baptized into Christ and his death. Yes. Sounds like we were on the cross with him. That's a whole other sermon. <laughs> Romans 6.3. We're united with him in his resurrection. Romans 6, 5, we are seated with him in the heavenly places, Ephesians 2, 6. Christ is formed in us as believers in Galatians 4, 19. So he is formed within us. Wow. He dwells inside of us, Ephesians 3, 17. He dwells in us. The church is the whole body of Christ, him being the head, right? And he's the chief cornerstone, 1 Corinthians 6, 15, 12, 27. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Yeah. That's uh, 2 Corinthians 13.5. We are in him, 1 Corinthians 1.20. The church is one flesh with Christ. You are one flesh with him. One baptism, right? One spirit. We're all one. It's like, what are you afraid of? To get close to him. To be intimate with him. I call it up close and personal. <laughs> it's about to get up close and personal. The Bible says that believers are found in Christ in Philippians 3, 8, and 9. So our union with Christ is profoundly real and intensely intimate. The union with Christ is not like a metaphor or a sentiment. It's not an illustration or it's not some form of doctrine like people say. It's the word of God. It's the whole New Testament. And it's found in the Old Testament. Amen. Because Hosea is a whole picture of the Father's heart. Yes. Yeah. Through, through Hosea and Gomer. So if he uses the illustration of Hosea running after a harlot, which we are all harlots until the Lord makes us a chaste virgin. If he uses the picture of his heart as someone running after a harlot that he wants to marry and clean up. Even though she's had children with other men, several other men, he still desires her. So if he's giving us that picture for Israel, how much more for us when we have a greater covenant? Yeah. We are Israel. It's like, it, 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 it dumbfounds me. Because you, you wouldn't believe after for 27 years preaching this, how much the church people have come against me for this message. I mean, it's... I don't get it. It's okay because I'm not going to stop because it's, it's who I am. The Lord did it in me and through me. And some of the greatest messages of our life are what we walk through because he called us a living testimony. And it will never change. My message, Pastor, will never change. Jesus, that's it. He's the bridegroom and he loves you and he wants you and he desires you. And we are going to be part of the wedding feast. Because I read in Revelation where the spirit and the bride say come. That means there's two voices in the end time. The bride and the spirit. They're one. The bridegroom. So you have a voice. Use it. Our union with the living Christ is the essential truth of our new and eternal existence. It transcends our infinite understanding that we can be truly joined spiritually and bodily to the crucified, resurrected, incarnate person of Christ. There is no better news than this. <laughs> this is the good news. He will not leave you desolate. He will not leave you orphans. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Starting with uh, verse 6 through 15. Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2 verse 6. In the same way you receive Jesus our Lord and Messiah by faith. Continue your journey of faith progressing further into your union with him, 
for your spiritual roots go deeply into his life as you are continually infused with strength and encouraged in every way. For you are established in the faith and you have absorbed and enriched by your true devotion in him. Beware that no one distracts you or intimidates you in their attempt to lead you away from Christ's fullness by pretending to be full of wisdom when they are filled with endless arguments of human logic. For they operate with humanistic and clouded judgments based on the mindset of this world system and not the anointed truth of the anointed one. For he is the complete fullness of deity living in human form. And our own completeness, completeness is now found in him. We are complete in him, in the beloved. That's good news. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. We are completely filled with God as Christ's fullness overflows within us. He is the head of every kingdom and authority in the universe. And through our union with him, we have experienced circumcision of heart. And all of the guilt and the power of sin has been cut away and is now extinct because of what Christ, the anointed one, has accomplished for us. For we've been buried with him into his death. And our baptism in his death means that we were raised with him and we believe in God's resurrection power. The power that raised him from death's realm. For this realm of death describes our lower former state. We were held in sin's grasp, but now... We have been resurrected out of that realm of death, never to return, for we are forever alive and forgiven of all of our sins. Now, this is the part, because sometimes we forget when we believe in Jesus and we get born again. How many born again believers we have in here? Okay, born again. Okay, when you're born into something, it's new, right? He canceled out every legal violation we had on our record and the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us. He erased it all. Our sins are stained. Soul, our sin stained soul. He erased all of it. He deleted it all and they cannot be retrieved ever. Wow, that's good news. Amen. That's good news. <laughs> Everything we once were in Adam has been placed onto the cross and nailed permanently there as a public display of cancellation. Wow. This next part, I'm about to get fired up right now with the bridal fire here. <laughs> then Jesus made a public spectacle of all that stiff that the enemy thought he got away with with you. He made a public spectacle of all the powers and principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon and all their spiritual authority and power to accuse us. And by the power of the cross, Jesus led them as prisoners in a procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner. They were his. That's something to get excited about. That's something to rejoice about, especially when the enemy comes to you and reminds you of something that you've done. I mean, that's New Testament. That's not my opinion. Those aren't my words. That's what Jesus did. Sometimes I just get that out and I read it to the devil. When he comes against me with my daughters or different things in the ministry, I just read that to the devil. My daughter knows she's here. I read it to the devil. I read him the word. Uh, no, no, no. This is what my husband says, right? That's what my husband. That's what he says. You're, you're a stranger. Yeah. You see, we need to start becoming. There's a lot of actors in the body of Christ. They say a lot of stuff. They do a lot of stuff. But then when you see them one on one, like in a person, and something happens, and it's like, whoa, whoa. I thought that's what you believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we need his face again. We need to look into his eyes again. We need to say, Lord, teach me. Teach me how to love you. Teach me how to love you. Teach me how to be loved by you. 
Bring me into union with you so that I don't look at what's in the world, so that I don't look at all this stuff that I struggle with every day. I just say the saying that I have with Lily's is, I'd rather be drunk in the spirit than sober in the flesh. <laughs> That's me. I'm a lush. I love the joy of the Lord. I love being in the spirit. It's amazing. Is it not, Crystal? It's amazing. It's amazing. Holy Pastor. When you're drunk, it's like, you know, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. Come on, you all know the word, right? I'm not talking about alcohol here. I'm talking about the new wine that the Lord's promised oh, yeah. to those who believe. We need him again. We need to come back to our first love. Pastor, we need to fall in love with him again. And never let it stop. That he be our everything. And when that happens, everything falls in place. It's amazing. It's, it's just amazing. I mean, I'm not saying we don't have battles, but when we turn back to him and say, okay, you said that you would take this over. It's okay. I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you. I want you to go to uh, last chapter, last uh, scripture, John chapter 2, verse 1. This is the wedding at Cana. This is something. Uh, John chapter 2. Thank you so much, sweetheart. I just love you. <laughs> Standing up there, I was just so, so anointed. Thank you, Lord. All right, I'm just going to run through this because there's a message in here the Lord has for you. Now, on the third day, there was a wedding feast. <laughs> Hang on just a second. The Lord just bringing something up to me. I can hear this, this. I don't understand how I can do it, but sometimes I can pick up thoughts that people are thinking. I don't understand it, but the Holy Spirit is showing me to share this, this scripture uh, or the story in the Bible. Um, I think it's in Luke. It's about Zacchaeus. Luke 19, I believe. Luke chapter 19. And how many remember that story with Zacchaeus and, you know, Jesus was coming into town and, and he was, you know, he was a crook, okay? And the disciples knew it and Jesus was coming into town with a crowd and he goes up into a tree and because he wants to see Jesus real short so he can't see, so he wants to see Jesus when he comes into town. And Jesus spots him in the tree and says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your, your house today. And the disciples were like, wow. He's going to a crook's house? <laughs> kind of like what we say when we don't understand what, yeah, okay. So he goes to Zacchaeus' house, and how many know that Zacchaeus, his name means pure? Jesus wasn't looking at his sin. Jesus wanted to be with him. Jesus knew his name. <laughs> when you were calling him a crook, Jesus was saying he was pure. So when he came and had dinner with him at his house, Jesus was so kind, loved on him, to such an estate that Zacchaeus says, I'm going to pay back four times of what I've taken. Will you let me make it right? Tells Jesus this. Will you let me make it right? Because of the convicting power of love, the love of Christ, the convicting power, what if? We just became one with Jesus, and it was just his heart flowing out of us. And it was just his desire flowing out of us, because we're so one with him. That when the world calls someone crook, we see pure. And we spend a little bit of time. And then Jesus said, because of that, because you said, can you imagine how Zacchaeus must have felt? Like Zacchaeus was like, I'm a crook and you're here. And you're loving on me. And you're honoring me. Can you imagine the convicting power of that love? And Jesus said, because of that, you are the son of Abraham, right? And he also said, 
you and your whole household would be saved. A crook that climbed a tree just to see him didn't even know that he knew his name. It makes you think. It makes you think. The Lord wanted me to share that, but um, I'm going to read this uh, wedding in Canaan. Okay, so. And the mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus' disciples were all invited to the banquet. But with so many guests in attendance, they ran out of wine. And when Mary realized it, she came to him and asked, They have no wine. Can't you do something about it? <laughs> his mother. Jesus replied, my dear one, don't you understand that if I do this, it won't change anything for you, but it will change everything for me. Because this would be his first miracle before it's done. Right? My hour of unveiling my power has not yet come. Mary then went to the servers and told them, whatever Jesus tells you, make sure that you do it. Now there were six stone water pots standing nearby. Now what got me on this is it says there were six stone water pots. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes me think some religious folks. <clears throat> I, I look uh, kind of sometimes behind the words. <laughs> the Holy Spirit shows me some things. <laughs> because these six uh, stone, they represented um, what the Israelites used to do for like a ceremony type thing. That's what these jars were for. So it's about religion. Okay, they were used for that. <laughs> they, were, they were meant to be used for Jewish washing rituals. Each one held about 20 gallons or more. Jesus came to the servers and told them, fill these pots with water right up to the very brim. Then he said, now fill your pitchers and take them to the master of ceremonies. And when they poured out their picture for the master of ceremonies to sample, the water became wine. When he tasted the water that became wine, the master of ceremonies was so impressed, although he didn't know where the wine had come from, but the servers knew, he called the bridegroom over and said to him, Every host serves his best wine first until everyone has had a cup or two. Then he serves the wine of poor quality. But you, my friend, bridegroom, Jesus is the bridegroom at someone else's wedding. That's just so amazing to me. I love it. But they missed that part, but, you know. But you, my friend, you have reserved the most exquisite wine until now. <laughs> this is the word for tonight. I built you all up to get you to this point. Okay? We're going to deal with that spirit of religion first. And then God's going to fill you with his new wine. <laughs> the most exquisite wine. One. This uh, miracle that came was the first of many extraordinary miracles Jesus performed in Galilee. This was a sign revealing his glory, and his di disciples, well, can't even talk, believed in him. So, here's the message. This the, the pots. To me, refer to the container, right? But the water that God fills this water with is the word. If you are full of water and you are full of the word, then you're good. But the Lord tonight wants to change that water into wine. Uh, he wants to give you the new wine of the Spirit so you can laugh again. So you can enjoy Him again. So you can come into His presence where it's a beautiful thing to serve the living God. Where it's an amazing thing and that desire will come back. That insatiable desire for him and him alone. Amen. Nobody else will do. Nothing else will do. Honestly, and I mean this respectfully, not that Bible studies are wrong, but Bible studies and prayer meetings, none of that will do without Jesus. You have to have him first. And then you go in and you're just in the glory cloud with him. And you're reading the scriptures, and you're all, I mean, you're supposed to be songs and hymns and spiritual songs, and that's the whole church in the book of Acts. Everybody was happy. Yeah. It is possible. <laughs> it is possible to be one. Yes. But the only way, and I believe I shared this a couple of Sundays ago with the exhortation, the only way that we're going to become one is to fall in love with him. Yeah. 
It's not going to happen any other way. You can't sit them down and talk to them or, or work these things out and, and, and oh, we're going to try to, and, you know, endeavor to do unity. I understand all that. Fall in love with him and it won't be a problem. Yeah, that's good. Because you start seeing everybody in a drunken state. <laughs> you don't care what they think. Yeah. I mean, my dad years ago, when, before God delivered him in 1985, uh, he was an alcoholic. And you all know his testimony. You know my dad. Um, before, when he used to be drunk, he was one of those happy drunks, okay? He drank for 30 years. He'd come home, and I knew I was getting money. There you go, okay? Number one, he loved me. Number two, he's drunk. <laughs> and he's a happy drunk, so he doesn't even know how much he's given. <laughs> I'm serious. And he would come home and like, Daddy, I love you, Daddy. And sit on his lap, and he'd give me money, you know, tell me I can go to this or that, whatever, until my mom came home. But... I'm just saying, I got away with it for a while. That's what drunks do. They don't care. I had one woman come and sit me down and try to tell me that there's something on my website and, and you know, anyway, about that, that she needed to tell me about the end times and that, that I needed to be more prepared for the rapture and all this stuff. And I sat there at the table and I laughed uncontrollably. Barb was there. I said, I don't care. I don't care when the rapture is taking place. Or if it is, I don't care about the end times. Well, what do you mean? I don't care. I'm in love. I care about Jesus. And I care about the people he's sending me to. If he wants to come for me now, praise God. If he wants to come for me in two years, praise God. Who cares? I'm in love. He's everything. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. And if it does, check your appetite. Check your appetite. And so I know everybody in here has a full water pot. And I really feel like, I mean, I have Lisa. This is, this is my Lily team, that, so it's amazing. I have Lisa, Barbara, and Linda. And we all want to lay hands on you. And we want to see Jesus because he's so in love with you. He's so recklessly in love with you. He just wants to touch you tonight. I want to see him turn that water into wine so that you can have your joy back, so that you can get happy about him again, so that you can get excited about getting up at 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 in the morning, whatever your time is, you know, time slot with the Lord, that you get excited about being with him. Sometimes it's hard for me to sleep at night because I'm like, okay, Lord, I just can't wait to get up in the morning. <laughs> I want to be with you. I go out in the field and I be with him because he's so beautiful and he meets me there. And so I'm just saying, it's different for everybody. However you do it, it doesn't matter. Just as long as you do it, that's all he cares about. Yeah. Yeah. He's not into all that stuff. He just wants you to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and if you if you need a healing in your body, yeah. nothing like the new wine if you make that happen. Yeah. That's true. Why did he say he saves the best wine for last? Why in Joel 2 did he say he's going to pour out his oil and his wine in the end time, in the last days? Why did he say he's going to do that? He wants to. He wants to. And so, is it, would that be okay, Pastor? Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, Lord, I just thank you right now, Lord. I thank you for every person here, every soul that you brought into this building tonight is a desire of your heart. Every soul that came in here, Lord, you are passionate about. Every soul that came in here, Lord, you love deeply and dearly. And you're calling them. You're calling them to come closer. And you're calling them to come deeper. And so, Lord, I thank you for that, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you want to turn the water that they have in them, that, that, that they have already in them, into wine, Lord. That you want to have them experience joy again. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Joy to serve you. Joy to do things that they, that they could do out of the joy of their heart just because they love you, Lord Jesus. Even when they wash the dishes, Lord, at home, they're doing it because they love you. And they do it with joy. I thank you, Father God, that you want to cause them to live a life with you, Lord, as the bridegroom. That you want to bring them into oneness with you in such a way that they never just walk into a prayer time. But they always have you with them 24-7. 
24-7 every day, that they're constantly praying, that they're constantly talking to you, Lord, because you never leave them. You're always there. And so, Lord, I ask you tonight, Lord, just like you showed me, Lord, that you were going to pour your new wine. You were going to turn that water into wine, Lord, that's in them, Lord. And we thank you for it, Lord. Give them joy again, Lord. Let them have the joy of their salvation again, Lord. Spring up the well that is in them, God, to come forth in the name of Jesus. Lord, that they would be excited about you. That they would be excited about even visiting their neighbor. That they would be excited about the people at their job, Lord Jesus, to be just just to bless them and love them just like you did Zacchaeus, Father God. Just like you did, the Father, the, even the tax collectors that you sat down with, Lord, that you just wanted to be with them, Lord. Lord, I pray that that kind of passion would come back into your body here, Lord Jesus, at Hilltop. Lord, I thank you for the changes, Father God, but I ask you, God, that you would come in more than you ever came, Lord. I ask you, Lord. We need you, Jesus. We can do nothing without you. We cannot do another thing without you, without your heart, Lord. We don't want to be people who live on ambition. We don't want to be people who strive to get you to do something, Lord. We want to come out of a place of rest and just be with you. And so, Lord, I pray that tonight, Lord. And I thank you for your presence here. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord. Let your word find its place in each and every one, Lord. Lord, you know the ones who are hurting. There's somebody in here who has a broken heart. And the Lord wants to give you joy again. He wants to give you joy for the future. He knows the future and the hope that he has for you. It's good. It's good. Will you let him heal your broken heart? Do you know that he came for the broken hearted? Do you know that he gives beauty for ashes? Do you know that he gives the oil of joy for the spirit of heaviness? Do you know that he will clothe you with the garment of praise? Do you know that he has anointed us? Hallelujah. He has anointed us to lay hands on you so that he can heal you, so that he can set you free. Lord, I thank you for that broken heart. I thank you that it's, you are so near to the broken heart and it's priceless to you, Lord. Lord, I thank you that your longing be evident tonight, that your longing, hallelujah, your desire be fulfilled tonight in this place. And Lord, I thank you for it, Lord. I want everybody who really wants to receive, just, I don't even like to say that. Just want something from the Lord. Just come up here so that the Lord can meet you here at the altar. The altar is holy. It's a, it's a holy place. Don't come up here for me. Come up here for him. He's calling you. He's desiring you. He wants you. He wants you to know, first and foremost, that you are loved. You are loved beyond anything. Thank you, Lord. 